Your grace is enough. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. God's grace is enough, isn't it? God's grace is more than enough. One of the things I enjoy about the technologies of today is how they allow us to be in contact with people that we haven't seen for many, many years, perhaps. One of those technologies is Facebook. And with Facebook, I'm able to connect with congregants from former churches, with fellow clergy all over the world, with friends of mine from college and from high school. And just recently, I was able to connect with a friend, someone from high school. We'll call him Jim. He lived not too far, just a couple blocks away from where I lived when I was growing up. Jim had a rough home life. There was not much there for him in the way of encouragement from his parents. You could often go by Jim's home in the afternoon and you could hear his parents, particularly his father, shouting at him. What the blank is wrong with you? You're not too bright, are you? You're never going to amount to much. Those words work their way into Jim's psyche. That's how he began to see himself. You would hear him speak. I'm no good. I just can't do that. I'm going to be a failure. I'll never amount to much. Guess what? Jim never amounted to much. He went to college but had to drop out. He'd gotten involved with the wrong crowd and started to do drugs. He fell in love and got married. But the marriage ended in divorce. And just recently, he'd spent some time in jail for dealing drugs. He had heard that declaration of failure over his life. And all of the other voices of creation that could have spoken power into him had been drowned out by the voices he was listening to. The ones that said he'd never amount to much. Maybe we know people like Jim. Maybe Jim is in some ways like some of us. Maybe we have that voice to contend with. A voice that declares that we are inadequate, insufficient, not enough, lacking, destined to be nothing but a failure. The voice that says that we are unlikable and unlovable, unacceptable and not worthy of inclusion. The voice that says... You have no place, no worth, no value. You have nothing to offer. Have you ever heard the phrase, a self-fulfilling prophecy? It is a pr prediction that directly or indirectly causes itself to become true. It is our beliefs turning themselves into our reality. If you believe that you have nothing to offer, you will offer nothing. If you believe that you are a failure, you will always find ways to sabotage your success. If you believe that you are always sick, they will call you a hypochondriac. If you believe that you will never amount to anything, you will certainly amount to very little or nothing at all. If you believe that you are stuck, if you believe that the parking brake is on in your life and you don't know how to release it, if you believe you're stuck, you'll not go far. On the other hand, if you believe that you are blessed, you will feel blessed and be a blessing. 
And if you believe that the world God has created is filled with wonderful possibilities, then you will see opportunity around every corner. And if you believe that you are like, loved, accepted, included, and adopted by the grace of God offered in Jesus Christ, mediated to us by the Holy Spirit, then your life will flow with all of those blessings. So here's the pertinent questions that we have to ask ourselves. What do you believe is the truth of your life? What do you believe is the truth of our life together as a congregation? Are things hopeless? If you think so, they will be. Do you feel that you and we have nothing to offer? Then we will offer ourselves, the world, nothing. Do you think we're just abiding till we die? Then rest assured, death is near. If we hold on to the negative and believe it to be true for our lives, we will stay stuck. We will have our existence lived out as though we're trying to drive that car with the emergency brake engaged. So how do we release our brake and get our lives moving again? We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. We need to hear and believe Jesus' declarations over our lives. I love the way that Jesus motivates people. It's so different from the way Jim's dad tried to motivate him. Because that's what he was trying to do. He thought he was doing a good job as a father by putting his son down, thinking that perhaps that might lift him up. But when you put a person down, you put a person down. Jesus' way of motivating was so different than those negative influences that we experience in our lives. You've experienced that unhealthy motivation from time to time, maybe from your parents or a co-worker or your supervisor, maybe a member of the clergy, certainly the person that you call husband or a wife. You've experienced those unhealthy motivations. Guilt. Oh, if you could do this for me, I sure would appreciate it. But, honey, don't you worry about me. I know you've got more important things to worry about in your life. If you just look out for yourself, don't worry about little old me. You ever heard that? How about threats? You do it my way or else. Or else you're fired. Or else I will hurt you. I will leave you. Little kids will say, I will hit you. I will make your life a living hell. How about embarrassment and shame? Oh, I can't believe you would do something like that. What would your mother think? Now let's acknowledge that guilt and threats and embarrassment, they can influence action, they can alter behavior, but the reality is they have no impact on the heart and mind, no positive impact anyways, and so there is no lasting change, there is no real transformation. I knew a man on the eastern shore, full-grown adult man, who at a fair had to run around the corner to smoke a cigarette so his mother would not see him. A full-grown man afraid of his mommy. I understand that. I'm afraid of my mommy too. Jesus didn't use those negative motivators. Jesus' aim was more than just simply altering our behaviors and our actions. He wanted to empower human lives, hearts, and minds. He wanted to inspire real and lasting, not change, but transformation. Transforming the way a person thinks and feels about God, about how God sees them, about their view of the world and their view of themselves in it. So Jesus speaks to those who are gathered on this particular day from the text, and he tells them who they are. 
he declares over them their identity. And then he encourages them to be who they are, to fulfill the identity that he has declared over them. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now understand he is not giving a command. He is not offering an instruction. He is not saying this is a rule and regulation and requirement. He is not saying go out and be salt. Go out and be light. He says you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. We know what salt does. It's used in the ancient world as a preservative. It is used to flavor our food. It is often used to offer or give people a sense of thirst. We know what light offers. Light is the gift of safety and security, of hope. You know the person who's the most popular on the block during a extended outage of power is the one who has one of those generators that keeps the lights on and the TV running. Jesus speaks over the lives of his people and he declares to each and every one of us this truth. He says, you are salt. You bring flavor. You preserve the things of the kingdom of God. You, by your life, make people thirsty for the kingdom of God. You are light. You offer hope and security by showing people the way to experience the grace of Jesus Christ. You are salt and light. Now, to whom is he speaking? to some special select group of people. No, the context of this is the Sermon on the Mount. And so in his audience was the 12 and then other disciples and then curious onlookers and farmers and fishermen and housewives and day laborers and tax collectors and people of ill repute and even folks who went to synagogue on the Sabbath. He was speaking to all kinds of people. Everyone who had shown up to hear his words on that day heard him say, you are salt and light. They heard him say, you bring preservative agents and flavor and thirst for the kingdom and safety and hope. He says it to all of the people in the crowd, the most motley group of people you could ever imagine finding, except maybe the ones that are gathered here today. Because I remember what you told me Art Graham used to say about Patterson Avenue Baptist Church. What was it he would say? It was filled with the wonderful, the weird, and the wacky. With an emphasis on the wacky. Now, why are we that kind of faith community? It is because we are a community of grace. And so we accept all kinds of people. We abide all kinds of people. We embrace and include all kinds of people. We love all kinds of people. You even like, love, accept, and include me. And my wife and kids will tell you I'm one of the oddest people you could ever want to meet. This is not a weakness on our part. I know some might suggest that, but it's not. The fact that we accept all kinds of people, even people like me, is one of our greatest strengths as a congregation because it is an expression of us being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And I have to tell you, this is not a quality that you find in many congregations. There are many congregations out there that are more concerned with all of their standards than they are with love and grace. They're more concerned about dictating behavior and the way a person looks and dresses and what their beliefs are and if they've got everything all lined up and are their dogmas and doctrines all in a row and is their lifestyle the kind of lifestyle that good, proper, respectable people in church ought to live like. That's what, that's what a lot of places are, but we are not that kind of place. We are a place of grace. 
We are salt and light. Jesus wasn't the kind of person who came and declared standards. He claimed, came and declared the reality of how God saw people. He declares the value and worth of the Father over us. He declares how we should see ourselves and the kind of impact that we can have on the world. He says to us, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. We're not far enough away from Christmas that I can't use one more Christmas illustration, are we? One of my favorite cartoons at the season since I was a little kid was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And in one of the scenes in Rudolph's cartoon, Rudolph ends up at the Island of Misfit Toys. And there's a crowd there that you wouldn't believe. Toys that were not quite up to snuff by the standards of many. And what was it that we discover? Each of those misfit toys had a place. Each of those so-called misfits could bring joy into a child's life. And Jesus comes to us, people that we might consider ourselves and others to be misfits. And he says, not just at the Sermon on the, South, on the Mount, but to all of us today, to all of us wonderful, weird, and wacky people, he says to us, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He is expressing confidence in the God of creation, the one who formed us just as we are. He is expressing confidence in the God who redeems us just as we are. Patterson Avenue Baptist Church, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus declares this confidence over your life, over my life, over our community of faith. I want you to think about that. I want you to let it sink in deep. Savor it. It's salt. Taste it. Meditate on it. Allow it to guide your path because it is light. You are salt and light. Now, sadly, when Jesus declares this truth over our life, many of us will spend lots of our days disbelieving it, denying it, rejecting it as truth. Here are the kinds of things I hear many of us say about ourselves. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not gifted enough. I've made too many mistakes in my life to be worth anything to anyone. I'm broken down and beaten, worthless and useless. Here are some of the things I've heard said about our congregation. We're just too small to make a difference. We don't have enough resources to minister the kingdom to our community. We don't have the knowledge or the training or the abilities. Is it any wonder that sometimes we feel like we're stuck in the mud? Any reason why it feels like sometimes we're pushing the brake down while driving down the road? It's that old self-fulfilling prophecy at work. It's the voice of the tempter, the liar, the confuser, the evil one. It is the voice that speaks lies to us as though they were truth. And so for us, the act of faith today, the call of discipleship, is not that we become something, but that we be the person Jesus has already said that we are. That's the faith choice. The question is, who are we going to listen to? Jesus who tells us that we're the salt of the earth? Or all of our insecurities, fears, worries, and doubts? Who are we going to listen to? Jesus who says that we are the light of the world? Or the voices that says that you are a failure and will never amount to much? Jesus told us how God sees us. Jesus declares who we are. 
The call of Christian discipleship is that we be who Jesus says we already are. If we're going to take our foot off the brake and get moving, that's one of the steps that must be made. If we think that life is filled with hope and possibility and potential, it will be. If we think we can make a difference in someone's life, we most certainly will. If we think that we are filled with life from heaven above, we will live life completely different than if we think that that is not true. You see, we need to understand that we are not called to live for God by our strengths and our resources because our strength and resources are not enough. We are called to live from God whose life flows in us and makes us salt and light. We live from God's strength and God's resources. And my prayer is that we'll awaken to the reality of this grace. That we will continue to learn who we are as salt of the earth and light of the world, and that we will be who we are. Because when that happens, nothing will stop us. You are the salt of the earth. So here's the challenge as salt. Get out of the salt shaker. I want to challenge you to provide ministry to one person one new person that you've never cared for in that way before, before we gather and worship again next Sunday. You are the light of the world. If you've ever gone outside at night and grabbed a flashlight so that you could see the path, you certainly haven't taken that flashlight, thrown it in a paper sack, and tried to make your way. You take it out of the sack so you can see where you're going. I want you to take your light out from whatever is covering it and be the light that points to the grace of God. I want you to tell one person, just one person, before we gather together in worship next week, tell just one person the difference that Jesus and his grace has made in your life. You can do it. You are the salt of the earth. You can do it. You are the light of the world. So go ahead. Be who you are. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is Blessed Be the Name.